All right, so I'm going to uh, kind of continue the talk from earlier today. And by the way, if anybody has any questions, I will try to answer them at the booth outside where I have the booth over at Gold Money. And, and if you have any cards that you filled out earlier today, you can hand them back to me. In fact, if you didn't get a card, if you want to fill out your name, get on my mailing list, um, I will, um, you know, you can grab some at the booth or here, just passing them out. But now, the U.S. economy is probably the most important economy from the perspective of most investors. You know, we are the largest economy. You want to measure it by GDP. We are certainly the biggest debtors. Americans borrow money from every other country. We borrow money from the poorest people in the world are lending money to the United States. We are the world's biggest importer. Of course, we don't pay for our imports with exports like a lot of other countries do. We just issue IOUs. So the world loans us the money that we need to buy the products that they produce. And they're loaning us money now at the lowest interest rates in history. I mean, why is that? I mean, why is America able to borrow so much money at such a low rate of interest? I mean, you're talking about interest rates that have never existed. And of course, it's not just the United States. Other countries are able to borrow money at rates that have never been known in, in recorded history. But if you think of interest as the price of borrowing money, what determines prices? Supply and demand. So why would a society have low interest rates? Well, it would be a society that had a lot of savings. Lots of people were under consuming and saving. And very few people were borrowing. Does that sound like the United States? It's actually the opposite of the United States. Right? Nobody is saving. You'd have to be a moron to save, but most people can't afford to save. They can't even afford to spend, right? They have to borrow. They don't earn enough money. They have to go into debt in order to spend, so there's no savings. And of course, governments, there's massive amount of government debt, and not just the federal government. The federal government has a $20 trillion national debt, but that's the tip of the iceberg, right? There's a lot more beneath the surface. The government guarantees all the student loans. It guarantees um, all the bank accounts. It guarantees all the pensions. Where's that liability? It's not part of that $20 trillion, but obviously a lot of those contingency liabilities are going to be real. Then the government has all sorts of debts like Social Security, Medicare, now Obamacare, Trump care, maybe, who knows? But the government has committed the taxpayer to all sorts of liabilities that are just as real as that $20 trillion. Because believe me, people who are expecting Social Security, they, you know, they expect that money. Same thing for people who work for the government and are expecting a government pension. Those government pensions are real liabilities, just like the bonds that creditors bought. So you add all that debt together, and you're talking about, I don't know, a $100 trillion plus number. And then you've got U.S. corporations that are loaded up with debt. Why do you think the stock market's so high? Because companies are making all these profits? No. Companies are able to buy back their shares with debt. They're able to sell bonds at very, very low rates of interest and then take the proceeds and buy back their own stock and push up the value of their shares. What about American Households, do they have any savings? No, they're, they're, they're loaded up with debt. You know, one of the statistics I hear, which is really not, not true, is that, oh, well, you know, American household debt is, um, you know, is not as bad as it was, let's say, in 2008. It's actually worse. In fact, if you look at U.S. household debt, it has now eclipsed the levels it was at just before the 2008 financial crisis. So we had a crisis that was brought about by excess debt, and now we have more debt today than we had then. But it's actually worse because mortgage debt has actually come down rather significantly. So if mortgage debt has come down, how is it that Americans have more debt now? Because, you know, the home ownership rate in the United States has fallen to near a 60-year low. So a lot of Americans that had homes and mortgages in 2008 don't have either today, right? So you can't have mortgage debt unless you own a home. And a lot of homeowners are now renters, so they don't have that mortgage debt. But what else they don't have is they don't have home equity. 
See, in 2008, a lot of Americans had houses that exceeded the value, at least on paper, of their mortgages. So they had an asset as part of their net worth. Today, for a lot of Americans, that asset is gone, yet the debts are still there. So why do Americans have more debt today, despite the fact that many, you know, a lot of Americans don't have mortgages? And that's because of credit card debt, it's because of student loans, and it's because of automobile debt. Right? You have over a trillion dollars in each of these categories. If you add up all three, you've got over three and a half trillion dollars of student loans, credit card debt, and auto debt. That has been what has been fueling U.S. consumption. It hasn't been income. It's been debt. It's been the ability to buy things that you can't afford on credit with cheap money. Now, of course, some people will point to the low unemployment rate to say, well, the U.S. economy is in good shape because look how low the unemployment rate is. Right? It's the lowest it's been in like 50 or 60 years. Well, if unemployment is really that low, right? first of all, why did so many people vote for uh, Donald Trump? If the economy is that great, right? why, why, you know, why didn't people want more of the same? Why didn't people vote for Hillary Clinton so that you know, all that great stuff would continue? Why did people want to change something that's so good? Because that number is nonsense. The way the government measures unemployment is, I guess it's similar to the way they measure inflation. The number is not designed to be accurate. It's designed to paint a rosy scenario so that people believe that things are better in the U.S. economy. How did the unemployment rate get to be so low? Is it because so many Americans that used to be unemployed are now working? No. It's because so many Americans that used to be employed aren't even looking for jobs. And if you're not looking for a job, then you're not counted as being unemployed. But the other way that the government was able to manufacture all this employment is by counting people who have part-time jobs as being employed. Because once upon a time, if you had a part-time job, that didn't count. Especially if you were looking for full-time jobs. Because sometimes people take a part-time job just to make ends meet while they're looking for a full-time job. So if you still spend most of your time looking for work, you're unemployed, right? If you're an, if you're an engineer, but you're, you know, you're, you're um, cooking French fries you know, for 20 hours a week, and then you're spending the rest of your day looking for an engineering job, you're an unemployed engineer. You're not a fry cook. But now, if you have any job, even if you work an hour a week, you're employed. Even if you spend the other 40 hours looking for a job, you don't count as being unemployed. And in fact, if you have more than one part-time job, but all of your part-time jobs together add up to a full-time job, all those part-time jobs get scored by the government as being full-time jobs. See, that's one of the reasons that we were able to create 200,000 jobs a month, month after month under Barack Obama. It was because we had this massive transition in the U.S. economy from full-time employment to part-time employment. And a lot of that was driven by Obamacare itself. Because when Obamacare was passed, the, the law said that if you are an employer and you have 50 full-time workers, you have to provide very expensive health insurance for every one of your employees. And so what that law effectively did was say that you're not going to have more than 50 employees. And an employee has to be somebody who works full time. You have to work 30 hours or more. So what the employer said, okay, we're not going to have more than 50 full-time employ employees. And it's actually worse. Like if you own a bunch of franchises, let's say I own a bunch of McDonald's franchises, because sometimes fr people own more than one restaurant. If I own five restaurants and collectively all five of my restaurants have 50 employees, I got to pay health insurance for everybody. It's not, it's not per restaurant, right? So people that owned a number of these small restaurants knew, okay, I can't have full-time workers. So all throughout the United States, employers were transitioning from a full-time workforce to a part-time workforce because it was too expensive to employ part-time people because of Obamacare. Now, what does that do to the numbers? Well, that means all sorts of jobs are going to be created. Look at employment in the United States. You can look at employment in the restaurant industry, in waiters, waitresses, off the charts. We've created so many jobs, yet 
Fewer Americans are actually eating out. Look at what's happening to a lot of the restaurant stocks. Same thing in retail. We've created all these retail jobs, yet retail store after store in America is shuddering, shuddering. In fact, the retail industry in the United States today is in worse shape if you look at store closings and layoffs, I mean, just store closings rather, and bankruptcies. Retail is in worse shape now than it was in 2008. So if restaurants, if people aren't eating out, and if people aren't shopping at brick and mortar stores, why has there been so much hiring? Why have we created so much jobs in these sectors? 10%, I think 10% of all the jobs created under Barack Obama were created in uh, retail, restaurants or stores. How is that possible? Again, it's all because of the part-time people. If you lay off a full-time worker and you replace him with two part-time workers, that's plus one job. Right? When they report the jobs, they don't report quality of jobs. They, they just report the net. So if you lose 100,000 full-time jobs and you create 200,000 part-time jobs, that's plus 100,000. And in fact, if you look at Americans now, the number of Americans who have two and three jobs at all-time record high. So many Americans now working three jobs, but they don't even make as much money now as they did when they had one real job. And we've lost a lot of productive jobs, a lot of goods producing jobs, and we have all of these low paying service sector, non-productive jobs, which is why the trade deficit keeps going. I mean, we're employing all these people, why don't we see a reduction in the trade deficit? Because they're not making anything, right? They're employed, but they're not productively employed. And so when they spend their paychecks, they have to spend it on products that were made in other countries. And so more and more stuff is being imported. So you see the trade deficits going up. They're not going down. I mean, if America had a real economic recovery, you would see our trade balances declining. I mean, people like to say, oh, no, when people are wealthy, they go out and spend more. No, when they're wealthy, they produce more, right? Production is a sign of affluence, right? Debt and consumption are not, right? Or they'll say, oh, America is this you know, prosperous economy, and that's why we're going into debt. A sign of prosperity is getting yourself out of debt. Right? When you're paying off your liabilities and you're accumulating assets, that shows that a nation is, uh, is, is advancing. But what the United States has been doing is we've been accumulating debt, but we put out all these statistics and people look at them, oh, the, the, you know, the unemployment rate is so low, the GDP keeps growing. Well, why is the GDP growing? Well, the GDP, I think, is really growing is because the inflation, the actual inflation in the U.S. economy is being underestimated. And you know, the government, I just read, that government economists are now claiming that inflation is being overstated, right? That actually, that they need to change the, the measurement again. The last time they did this was with the Boskin Commission, right? Back in the 1980s, the government said, hey, our inflation measures are wrong and we got to go and refigure it because the numbers are too low, right? They said that the, the official numbers were underestimating inflation. And so they went back and they, they changed the way they calculate inflation. And what do you know? Now inflation is lower, right? Not because prices are rising more slowly. It's just because of the, the way that we measure the rise. And of course, what are the, what are the politicians saying again, or the economists? They're saying that the current uh, way that we calculate inflation is still not giving enough credit for improvement in quality. So they're saying we've got to make more reductions because things are getting so much better. Not, they don't really cost more. We're just getting so much more for our money. But you know, from my perspective, there are a lot of things where the quality is going way down. In fact, there's probably more examples where you get less for more. And none of that gets factored in uh, to the CPI. I mean, all sorts of things that you used to be able to buy that were fully assembled, now you buy it and it's in 100 pieces. And you got to put it together yourself, and it takes you three or four hours. What's your time worth? Right? According to the government, nothing. Right? So there are a lot of products where it's going the other way. But all this government is trying to manipulate. So our nominal GDP growth in the United States has been minimal. Right? We haven't even had, under, under Barack Obama, we didn't have one year of 3% growth. Generally, we had growth of under 2%. We had uh, 1.2 is what the government estimated annualized for the first quarter for the U.S. And that's despite the fact that we've had the lowest inflation 
at least the lowest official measures of inflation ever. Well, I think if we had a more accurate, a more honest measure of inflation, the result would reveal that the United States has pretty much been in recession for the entirety of this recovery. And I mentioned at my talk earlier today that this is the first recovery that is actually weaker than the recession that we recovered from. Right? It's the first recovery where people are poorer at the end than at the beginning. Right? Real net worths went down during the recovery. Real wages fell during the recovery. It doesn't sound like a recovery, and the reason is because it's not. The government manufactured it with statistics, but the statistics didn't fool the voters. That's why the voters elected Donald Trump, because they want to change. But unfortunately, they're not going to get change. They're going to get more of the same, because I think we are now, and I mentioned earlier, headed for a complete collapse of this system. I don't think there's, there's much more air that can be put into this bubble. Right? The 2008 financial crisis was a sign that the, the end is here, or end is near. That, that was the beginning of a process. But the fact that the central banks, and not just the Federal Reserve, but central banks all around the world have had to pull out the stops to try to keep the wheels from coming off this bus. I mean, you've got interest rates now in, in Europe that are negative, in Japan. They're not negative here, but real rates are negative in the United States. Because if you look at even the government's own inflation measures, as bad as they are, still show that we have negative interest rates in real terms. And the reason that central banks have been able to con the world into accepting this is the idea that there's no inflation, that there's never going to be inflation. Well, this is about to change. If you look at measured inflation rates around the world, as bad as these numbers are, you're still seeing official inflation in the United States, Europe, and Japan around five, five six-year highs. All these, all these central banks. Now, even in, 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 uh, in Europe, the, the CPI now uh, is 1.9% year-over-year increase. That's it. That's, that, they can't let it go any higher. Right? If you ever listen to Mario Draghi, he always says that the, the goal of our monetary policy is to have inflation close to but below 2%. Well, that's it, 1.9. You can't really get much closer than that. And if you get to two, point, if you get to two that's too high. So they're going to have to start backtracking. But people are going to find out, and central bankers are going to find out, that inflation is a very difficult uh, genie to put back in the bottle. And you cannot stop on a dime. I mean, this whole inflation targeting is complete nonsense, that we need some positive amount of inflation, as if inflation is actually beneficial, that without inflation, right? And when I say inflation, they really mean rising prices, right? So economists think, we need prices to rise by almost 2% a year. And if they don't, it's going to be a disaster, right? Prices going up only by 1%. Why is that a problem? If the cost of living goes up 1%, why is that worse than the cost of living go up 2%? And what's the problem if the cost of living goes down? I mean, isn't that a good thing, right? If my costs are lower, if food is cheaper, if education is cheaper, if health care is cheaper, what's wrong with that, right? I mean. My cell phones get cheaper. No one complains about that. That's not a bad thing. Computers get cheaper, right? This whole stuff is a bunch of nonsense. The governments are trying to justify inflation by trying to claim that it's good for us. It's not good for us. It's good for governments. It's good for debtors, right? But what's going to happen is as these inflation rates pick up, and they're going to pick up in the United States as well, what, is the, what are the central banks going to do, particularly in the United States? Nothing. It's all talk and no bite. So the U.S. economy, as I said earlier, this phony recovery is about run out of steam, right? We've, this recovery has been going on for eight, nine years, something like that. It started uh, 2009. It's already, I think, the second or third longest recovery in U.S. history. It is the weakest recovery in U.S. history, even the way the government measures it. But it's required more stimulus. We've had more government stimulus than ever before, more money printing, more artificial, and all they can produce is one of the weakest recoveries ever. But according to the budget that Donald Trump just submitted to Congress, it's going to last for another 10 years. America is not going to have a recession, according to uh, Trump, for at least another 10 years. And according to Trump, the economy is going to grow by 3% average during those 10 years that we have no recession. 
despite the fact that we haven't had one in, what, eight, eight years, which would mean that if the Trump budget is correct, this is going to be the longest um, expansion in U.S. history, and it'll be more than twice as long as the, the second longest, right? None of this stuff is true. And, and so once the economy turns down, which it will, I mean, it, we could enter recession this year, we could be there. And remember, the government doesn't admit you're in a recession, in many cases, till it's almost over. Remember, the Great Recession of 2008, I was going on television shows summer of 08, talking about this recession that I thought was coming. We were already in it, right? And I, you know, but the people I was arguing with were saying, oh, no, no, there's no recession coming, everything is great, right? In mid-2008. But when they went back and tried to figure out the beginning of the recession, they went back and changed all the GDP numbers. And they went back to the fourth quarter of 2007, and they said, that's when the recession began. But they didn't admit that till it was close to the end of 2008. And then they went backwards and they said all the numbers that we gave were wrong. So the first quarter, which the government said we grew at 1.2%, who knows? Six months from now, nine months from now, they can go back and say, no, the economy contracted. We got some numbers wrong. You know, a lot of the numbers are just guessing anyway. And again, the, the, um, the inflation numbers are much too low to be, to be believable. But we go back into recession, and the Federal Reserve is going to, what are they going to do? They're going to cut interest rates. But how much are they going to cut them? They're almost at zero. I mean, even if they succeed, let's assume they raise interest rates again in June. Right? The markets figure the odds of that are 100%. If that's true, despite how bad the economic data is, because remember, the Federal Reserve has been saying the whole time that they're data dependent. Meanwhile, the data that they, claim on, that they claim to depend on has been lousy. Right? One of the reasons I thought the Fed was not going to raise rates was because I thought they would use the weak data as an excuse not to raise rates. But they were dumb enough to raise rates anyway. And it's not because we don't need higher interest rates. They should be much higher. But the Fed doesn't care about doing what's right. The, the Fed cares about kicking the can down the road and just you know, kind of putting Band-Aids on a cancer because they don't want anybody to know how bad it is. And, and so when we have this next uh, downturn, since rates are only 1%, even if, they, even if they raise them again, right, they'll be one to one and a quarter if they raise them one more time. Right? Then we have recession. How much can they cut? From one to zero, how much stimulus is that going to be? So where is the stimulus going to come from? The Fed has already said it. Quantitative easing. They're going to do it all over again because they're convinced it worked so great the first time. Well, it never worked the first time. That's why the recession was so bad, because the government interfered. The government didn't allow the market. What, was, what, what should the Federal Reserve have done in the aftermath of 2008? They should have recognized that their policies caused the problem, that it was keeping interest rates too low that caused the speculative excesses and the economic imbalances, and they should have allowed free market forces to correct the problems that they created. Instead, they made all those problems bigger, and they bought us another phony recovery. But now we're going to have to deal with a real recession. Because when the Fed has to go back to QE4, that's it. When, they, the, when the Fed did the first round of QE1, the dollar started to fall. Gold rose up to $1,900 an ounce. Right? Because people began to be worried, this is not going to end well. This is bad. This is going to kill the dollar. They were right. But then they became convinced they were wrong because all of a sudden, the Fed announced, we're going to end this policy. We're going to taper quantitative easing. And everybody started talking about what a success the program was because now we're going to end it. Right? Yeah. I mean. It's easy to proclaim a success. It's easy to say we're going to end, the, end it without actually doing it. Yes, they've succeeded in raising interest rates up a tiny bit, but have they normalized them? Not even close. Has their balance sheet shrunk? No, not by a dollar. They have, they have not only have they not uh, allowed any bonds to roll off, but they've reinvested every nickel in interest, every, every interest payment that the Federal Reserve has received on any bonds that it owns, 
It's used that money to buy more bonds. So the Fed has not been able to unwind this policy at all. They've nudged interest rates up a little bit, but they're already setting the country up for the next recession. And I think this one is going to be worse than the Great Recession. We have far more debt now than we had then. All the banks that were too big to fail, well, they're much bigger now, and they'll fail again. So they're going to have to go back to QE4. And when this happens, the world is going to recognize, wait a minute. If they were not able to normalize interest rates the last time, if they couldn't shrink a $4.5 trillion balance sheet, how are they going to shrink an $8 trillion balance sheet or a $10 trillion balance sheet? Who knows how big this balance sheet is going to have to get right? as a result of the next quantitative easing program? I mean, we go into the next recession, they're going to have a tax cut. Right? The government is going to cut taxes. No one's going to be against the tax cut in a recession. And of course, we're going to have this big infrastructure spending, right? The government's going to try to stimulate the economy by borrowing money and fixing roads or building bridges. So if our deficits are already seven, eight hundred billion, I mean, the national debt actually grows in America by about a trillion a year, but somehow the budget deficit is not quite that high because a lot of the debt is off budget. But it doesn't matter if it's off budget, we still have to finance it. But if we already have budget deficits of close to a trillion dollars a year, during the recovery, where are they going to go in the next recession? Right? In the Great Recession, they shot up to a trillion. This time, they can go to two trillion. Now, how is the U.S. government going to borrow two trillion dollars a year on top of all the money they have to borrow? Because our national debt is financed with short-term paper. Right? It's all like an adjustable rate mortgage. The government doesn't borrow for 30 years, it borrows for 30 days. Now, of course, the Federal Reserve is pretending that it's going to unwind its balance sheet. Now, the reason I say it's pretending is because it can't do it. Because if we're going to run large budget deficits, how is the Federal Reserve going to sell bonds in competition with the Treasury? See, a lot of people say, well, the Fed's not going to sell. They're just going to let the bonds mature and not roll them over. That's the same thing. Because if the Federal Reserve doesn't roll over its debt, then the Treasury has to sell an additional amount of debt that's the same amount that isn't rolled over to repay the Fed. Because the Treasury doesn't have dollars. The Federal Reserve creates dollars. The U.S. Treasury can't create any dollars. So if the U.S. Treasury wants to get dollars to repay the Fed, it has to borrow them in the market. And if it's not borrowing from the Fed, it has to find a private buyer. So can you imagine having $2 trillion deficits and at the same time, the Federal Reserve or the Treasury having to borrow another $500 billion to pay off the Fed. So where, who's, going to do, who's going to be buying all those bonds? Nobody. Who's buying bonds now? I mean, no real investor is buying U.S. Treasuries, 10-year Treasuries at, what, 2%, whatever they're at, or 30-year Treasuries or not even 3%. Nobody is dumb enough to think that's a good investment. The buyers are foreign central banks. The buyers have been the Fed. The Fed is holding on to a huge portfolio of long-term treasuries. Banks have them because they're required to have them as, as, you know, as, as an asset. And speculators, you know what happens is people borrow money short and then they buy treasuries and they live off the carry. You know, if you do that with a lot of borrowed money, you can make money. But there's no real investors in this market. But I think that when the Fed goes back to QE4, Nobody is going to believe that this is a success. Nobody is going to believe that it's going to end. And as the official inflation numbers continue to move higher, right, and the Fed's inflation rate is 2.5%, 3%, 3.5%, 4%, it can go there very quickly. I mean, we're not too far. We're, you know, we're at 2.3%, 2.4% right now. We're already above their so-called 2% level. Remember, 4% inflation is where Nixon imposed wage and price controls. We're going to go through 4% inflation, and the Fed's going to do nothing. And why can't they do anything? Because it's impossible, because we have too much debt. What would happen? What would happen if interest rates went up to 5%? What would the interest be on a $20 trillion national debt? A trillion dollars a year. That's about four times what we spend right now. Where would the U.S. government get the extra money to pay the higher interest? What would happen to the housing bubble if mortgage rates went up? What would happen to corporations if interest rates went up? What would happen to commercial real estate in the United States? It would all implode. The whole house of cards is being held up by these artificially low interest rates. The only way we can service this debt is with these low interest rates. I mean, we can never repay it. 
And when our creditors figure that out, that's when they want their money back. That's when the music is going to stop. So what's going to happen is as we go to QE, I don't think the foreign central banks are going to be financing it again. Remember, Donald Trump will, 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 will label people currency manipulators, right? No one's going to want to just start printing money and buying up dollars to artificially prop up the dollar where Trump is publicly calling for a weaker dollar and trying to single out countries uh, that are manipulating the currency markets. What they're really doing is propping up the dollar. But when they stop propping up the dollar, it's going to collapse. And I think that ultimately the Federal Reserve sacrifices the dollar it's the one thing that they don't care about because they want to keep the bond bubble inflated. They want to keep the real estate bubble inflated. They want to keep the stock bubble inflated. And the only way they can do that is by printing money and trying to postpone the pain. But by doing that, they just make the pain that much worse. All these bubbles are going to deflate because eventually the Federal Reserve is going to have to choose between turning the dollar into monopoly money, having hyperinflation, or reluctantly and and much too late, eventually letting interest rates go up. And they're not just going to go up a little, they're going to go up a lot. They're not going to stop at 5%. Remember, under, under Ronald Reagan and Paul Volcker, they went to 20%. If they can go to 20% back then, when the United States was in much better shape economically, we, were, we had a much better balance sheet in 1980 than we do today. So if they can get to 20% then, they can go there again. And imagine what happens in, in the economy when that, when, if that's the case. I see here that I'm, that I'm out of time. So if anybody has any questions uh, about this or what to do, again, I had the talk earlier about how to prepare your portfolio. But I don't think this is something that's going to happen off in the distance. I mean, this is something that is going to happen soon as far as the scheme of your portfolio and your investments. And the quicker that you can insulate yourself from this, the quicker that you can devise a portfolio that will profit from this. I mean, there are going to be people that are going to make money from what's going to happen. I mean, far more people are going to lose money, and more important than losing money, they're going to lose the purchasing power that's associated with their money. You're going to have a lot of you know, poor people that are, that are rich in, in, in paper currency, but they're not going to be able to buy anything. So the key is preserving your purchasing power and owning the assets that will retain that purchasing power and actually grow in purchasing power as this crisis unfolds. Thank you.